Welcome to worship with the Edmonds Adventist Church. Notice I said with the Edmonds Adventist Church. We're not at the Edmonds Adventist Church, but we are together and we are grateful for that, that we can have a way of being together even though we're not meeting together. Let's invite God to be with us too. Lord God, we know where two or three are gathered, you are there. We know that even with each one of us individually, you are present with us. May we feel your presence and sense your presence and may your spirit transcend the distances that are between us today and bring us together in your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so glad that you've joined us today. We like to begin by thinking about our church and its members, and especially praying for those who are in need. And we have several requests that are new this week, just since last week, or updates since last Sabbath morning when we last met together. First of all, Mary Pease would like for us to pray for her sister, Kathy. Her sister, Kathy, went into the hospital this week with renal failure. She is doing better now, and they are going to find a rehab facility for her. They are not sure, however, that she will actually be able to uh, go back to living at home. And so... Um, I uh, want to pray for her and the family. I'm getting a note here from, uh, from our producer. So let me look and see what it says. Okay, we're, we're all right. Um, you know, technology is fun, and um, we're dealing with a little of that this morning, but uh, everything I think is okay at this point. So, as I was saying, and um, when I got interrupted in my mind, I don't think I said it very well. So, uh, Kathy is Mary's sister. She will be going to a rehab facility, not sure whether she'll get home again or not. Please pray for Kathy and for all of Mary's family, her brother and her sister, and also Mary's brother's grandson, Brian, was born on October 27, so he's just a hair over two weeks old, and he was born two months early. He probably isn't going to be able to come home from the hospital until mid-December, his mother is home now. She's doing fine. But we want to pray for little Brian and pray that he will be able to get home and will be breathing well and strong and healthy. Brenier is having to deal with some sores from his wheelchair, and we uh, want to pray that they will be able to get those healed soon. And also, he lets us know that his brother that we've been praying for is doing much better They've got him on a new medication, and so um, we are delighted with that. Paul had his first chemotherapy treatment this week. That's Paul Brower. Uh, it began on Monday, ended on Wednesday. He's doing well. He will have a CAT scan in about six weeks to see if this round of chemo is helping. We hope that it will. We hope he'll be able to tolerate it well. And he has the chemo every other week. So he'll have this week off, but it'll be back on the next week. Please pray for Paul and Bernice. We pray that this chemo will prolong his life and that he will be able to tolerate it well. Muriel Martinez had surgery yesterday. Pray that her recovery will be quick over the weekend because she is planning on starting a new job on Monday. We've been praying that she would find a job, and she has. So we pray that she will be able to get back to uh, work in a new capacity now on Monday after her surgery yesterday. Uh, Kathy Stewart has her grandchildren with her, which is a delight. She loves that. But unfortunately, 
her grandson, Leon, has COVID. And we want to pray for him, and we pray that the rest of the family will not come down with it. Bonnie Parle has asked us to pray for Martha Romero. We had been praying for her father, uh, who had cancer, and this week he passed away. So we want to pray for her comfort and comfort for all of her family. Also, Wendy Weaver has a cousin down in Texas named Joe who has COVID. He's doing somewhat better, but there are still symptoms hanging on with him. We want to pray for him. There are a number of people we're praying for who are struggling with cancer. Jeannie Dalrymple, Ernie McAdams, uh, Brenier's friends Gunnar and Sandra, Jen Vow's uncle, Gordy Short, Bonnie Parle's friend, Barb, Donovan Wells' father, Dan, up in Canada. And of course, that one is difficult because Donovan and Flavia aren't able to go up and see him because of the border uh, due to COVID. We also pray for continued recovery for uh, Donna, Brenier's housemate after her fall and hip surgery, Bill Davenport with his eyes, Cherry Babiak, who has been going through some difficulty lately, and uh, Wendy Weaver's aunt, Marla Sleeper. A number of people whose parents we've been praying for, Jody Bowers, Cliff, uh, Jody Bowers' parents, I should say, Cliff Borowitz's father, Gilbert Rodriguez's father, Wendy Unger's mother, Arlene, Wendy Weaver's mother, Cindy, Bonnie Parle's mother, Donna. Also, some other kinds of issues. We want to pray for Kathy Stewart's son, Tom, who, as you know, is in prison over in Montana. They've had COVID go through. He has recovered from that, but he's hoping to get soon a parole hearing, and we pray that that will come. We also pray for peace in our nation. We are going through a transition and we pray that it will be peaceful. And of course, we pray for this pandemic to be over. Right now, this surge is very troubling. We have many more cases than we've ever had before. 184,000 in one day yesterday of new cases. Wasn't that long ago that we hit 100,000 for the first time. And it's true that a fewer, uh, the smaller percentage of those with COVID are dying than once was. But there are so many cases that still the number of deaths is going up. This week, there have been almost 10,000 in our country who have died of COVID. So please be careful and please pray that the vaccines that they're working on will be successful and will work in bringing this pandemic to an end. Time for our offering. The offering today, uh, I would say the loose offering, but of course we, we don't have an offering basket, so there isn't any loose offering as such. But that offering is for the World Budget Global Mission to take ministry to places that it has never been. And uh, this is also called the annual sacrifice offering. To contribute to this, please write annual sacrifice on your offering envelope or on the internet, whichever way you give. Also, please remember our local church budget. You know, I've been thanking you because we have been doing so well during the pandemic. We've been ahead of last year. Up until last month in October, we did not have a good month in giving. We went into the month $7,000 ahead of what we had given last year in our church budget. We ended the month $5,000 behind what we had given last year in our church budget. So please remember our church budget. Now, some announcements, several of them today. The first one is really exciting. And I was going to tell you about it last week and I just forgot as I went through my list. Uh, shame on me. But it is exciting. It's the most exciting new ministry right now. It is our blessing box, our food pantry. And Rick can show us a picture here of what it looks like there beside the church. 
this is the ministry that uh, we know that Alfonso leads and Josh Daniel has volunteered his time to make this. It's beautifully done. And this is a food pantry and here's what we're doing with this. We are inviting you to put food in it. Uh, every time you get your groceries, get a few extras and put it here. And then we are announcing to our community that if they are finding food insecurity, they can come to our church and just open the doors and take what they need. So the idea of this ministry is leave what you can, take what you need. And if any of you listening need food, please feel free to come and take what you need. And then when you can, leave what you can. I checked yesterday afternoon. I took some groceries there yesterday and there was already a lot of food there and I added some. So we are well stocked at the moment, but we hope people will be using it. So we will need to continue stocking it regularly all the time. We are going to be sending out a Facebook announcement and we're going to boost it so that all the people around our area know about this. And once they know, I'm sure people will start using it. So check it out as you go by. If it's low, go get some groceries and add them in so that we can help make sure that everyone in our community is taken care of and have groceries. And a huge thank you to Fonz and to Josh for this ministry. Another exciting ministry right now is our shoebox ministry. We are filling shoeboxes to send to children around the world to enhance their Christmas. And I hope you have a shoebox and are filling it. Wednesday is the day, the last day that we can mail these. Sophia will be at the church Wednesday to receive your boxes. We have a number of them that are out that have not come back. So please bring those back by Wednesday. And if you don't want to go shopping in person and fill a box, you can do it online. Just go to our church website and it will only count toward our goal of 150 if you do this from our website. But go to our website and there's a place there where you can fill shoe boxes and it's very easy and it's actually kind of fun. I did it myself and uh, got a chance to add things. They give you options. You can pick what gender you want your shoebox to go to, uh, what age group, and then depending on gender and age, they give you options of what to put in the box. And you fill the box virtually and it will go to someone uh, in reality. So remember, Wednesday is the day. That's only five days away. Uh, for us to get these shoe boxes in. So please bring your shoe box by the 18th or go online by the 18th. And let's try to meet our goal of 150 shoe boxes. We had a board meeting on Wednesday night. A couple of things to report to you from that. You remember we've been doing a survey of whether we should start meeting in person again at this time. The survey, and we got a few more in this week, is just amazingly split 50-50. And so we really are uh, not all uh, in one consensus of what we ought to do. The board decided that they do not wish for us to start now meeting in person, but they do wish for us to be preparing for that. We have a committee that is working on getting live stream capability in our church so that when we do start meeting in person, we'll be able to continue live streaming. Not everyone will feel comfortable coming back. So that committee is doing a great job. They will be at the church tomorrow, in fact, working on this, and we really appreciate their work. But we will continue meeting online, at least for the time being. And of course, this surge uh, is troublesome right now. Here in our county, we have gone from a roll, you know, they have this figure that is a rolling figure over two weeks of how many new cases per 100,000 population. 
we were down to 70 just four weeks ago. And uh, to go to the next phase, to go to phase three, we have to get down below 25. Well, we were moving that direction and down to 70. And this last week, we were back up to 187. So it's not just across the country that this surge is troublesome, but right here in Snohomish County as well. So we hope it won't be too long, but for right now, we're going to continue doing it online. And as I say, working to get our church uh, capacity for online uh, live streaming for when we do come back in person. Also, another decision that our board has made is that uh, we are asking all of our church officers to continue on into the next year to have the ordinary nominating committee process during this pandemic when we're not meeting together would be more difficult. And so we're simply saying we'll have nominating committee begin again when we get back together. And in the interim, let's ask everyone to continue. Now, obviously, if you don't wish to continue, you can let Asha, the chair of our nominating committee, know that. But we hope you won't do that. We hope everyone who is an officer will continue in their role as we go into the new year. Originally, you were asked to serve until December 31 of 2020, but we hope you will extend that now. Two weeks from today on Thanksgiving weekend, November 28, we're going to have a different worship service. Several of our members are going to be telling Thanksgiving stories. We won't be having a regular sermon that week, but we're going to hear Thanksgiving stories from several people. We would like to know what you are thankful for, and we have a way for you to tell us. You simply go online. This is not to our website or not an email, but just to the URL. Go online at edmundsthanksgiving.org. That's edmundsthanksgiving.org. And when you go to that, you will find a form that asks what you're thankful for. We would like for you to fill out that form, submit it to us, and then on our Thanksgiving morning, we're going to have kind of a rolling uh, uh, stream to see what the, the people in our church are thankful for. So I hope you'll fill that out, edmundsthanksgiving.org. Uh, we had announced a, a youth outing for tomorrow. Uh, there was not enough interest in that, apparently, and it has been canceled. Be sure and go on our internet and see Wendy's playlist of praise songs. And also, um, we always like to look at the flowers that Carol shares with us on our, uh, on our Facebook page. I said website. I meant Facebook page for Wendy's list and for... Carol's Flowers. Let me go through the participants in today's service. Uh, our producer today is Rick Wright and Josh Daniel is doing our post-production. Uh, Sophia Fullerton assists in getting us on the Facebook page. Our children's story will be Jerry Anderson. Craig Lang will have our prayer. And we're going to have our retro special music. We're going to go back and have special music by Kingdom Praise, a video from when we were meeting together, uh, just to keep fresh in our minds what it's going to be like again when we're able to meet together in person. And then following the sermon, uh, Sophia Fullerton will be leading us in hymn 588. It's not one that's terribly familiar, but hymn number 588, Lord of All Nations. So now, kids, it is time for the children's story. Jerry Anderson has a great story for us today. So kids, come close to the screen and let's hear your children's story for today. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining for today's children's story. Um, 
I hope you can see the TV. We're going to have some cool uh, backup graphics for this story. So just forewarning there. Today's story is from many years ago when I was a little boy, about Alicia's age, maybe five or six, probably not even seven or eight, but anyways, about that age. Anyways, it's a long time ago. Um, the story takes place, I grew up on a farm up in Alberta and we used to have cows and in the springtime they would have calves. Now the springtime in Alberta can still be pretty cold and you can even have a little bit of snow around and, and you want to make sure the cows are fed well and that the calves aren't ending up in the, in the snow and so they're staying warm and I can almost still hear them. Let's see if we can hear some cows. There they are. Isn't that amazing? Um, anyways, we had some lean-to shelters that the cows could hang out in to get out of the cold. And, and we always kept some good straw and hay there for them to eat. Um, anyways, we kind of had this daily thing where I would ride in the truck with dad and we'd put feed in the back and take it out to the cows. He had his medicine toolbox and if there was a sick cow, he could give it a shot of uh, medicine or something like that. And, um, we also had this cool dog named Scout. He loved riding the back of that pickup truck. Didn't matter what weather it was. He would sit in the back and have his uh, head up in the wind, enjoying the fresh air. That was just the greatest thing uh, for the dog Scout. Anyways, uh, this one time we're feeding the cows and dad goes off away from the truck and he's out, you know, looking around for stray calves or whatever to make sure everything's okay. And I'm left with the dog back by the truck. And Scott was a pretty good dog. He didn't usually chase the cows. Actually, I don't know if he ever chased the cows or got too much trouble, but there's something about a, a cow with her calf. She gets very protective. Actually, for most mothers are pretty protective of their children. Uh, like if you think of bears and stuff, you don't want to get between a bear and her cub. Anyways, same thing with a cow and her calf. Anyways, Scout was uh, wandering around the cows and he must have got between a cow and her calf because all of a sudden I see this cow kind of getting angry and putting her head down. And then I realized, you know what? Scout's right next to me. And so um, next thing I know is this cow has his head down and he's running. She, she's running right at me. So my first response was kind of freeze. What's going on here? Second response is jumping up and down and screaming and waving my arms, thinking that maybe if I act really big, that maybe the cow will stop. I don't know. But let me pause the story right there. When I was young, the thing they taught us in church about praying was that it was important to fold your hands, close your eyes, and be kneeling and be very reverent. Now that is a good thing to pray like that because we are talking to the God of the universe. And so it is really good to show a lot of respect, all our respect to the God of the universe when we pray. But if we go back to our story, the thought that occurred to me when I was jumping up and down and screaming was that maybe I should say a little prayer. And so I did, even though outside it looked like I was yelling and screaming inside, I was saying a quick little prayer for God to please stop this cow. Cause I, I really didn't want to get hurt that day. And you know what? The cow did stop and I lived to tell the story and, uh, but ever since that day, it's always occurred to me that, you know what? There is never a bad time to pray. It is good if you can be reverent when you pray, but it's also good to pray whether you're scared out of your mind and screaming, or maybe when you're sad and crying, or maybe when you're happy and overjoyed. You know what? I even think it's okay 
to chuckle with God over something that's been funny and that you appreciate? Because I think God has a sense of humor. So I think, I hope that's the takeaway for you from this story is that uh, there's never a bad time to pray and that you can pray in, in, all, in all states of mind, no matter how you feel or whatever's going on. And I pray that every one of you will be blessed. And uh, remember, there's never a bad time to pray. So let's pray right now. Father God, thank you for each and every one that's uh, able to watch this uh, video and join us for church. And I pray that you will bless them and help them to remember that uh, you always want to hear from them. You always want to talk to them, no matter, no matter what's going on. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us for the story. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, your prayer. And um, prayer is always a, a good and a continual thing that we do in our lives as we always have our relationship with our Father. And it's also good to be in the Thanksgiving uh, season as we uh, celebrate um, the Thanksgiving season with our friends and family. So, and on top of that, I want to just say good morning to all you church family and happy Sabbath to all of you. And as we continue our service, um, let's be in the Thanksgiving mode and um, give our prayers and our praises to our Father in heaven. So join me in prayer at this time. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the Sabbath. And we thank you for uh, this season of Thanksgiving to be thankful for everything that we have, our, our jobs and our, um, our good health. Even though we're in the middle of this pandemic, I pray that this pandemic will end soon. I pray that we can get back to more of our normal lives and be back in our church and be back in our sanctuary. And Lord, all the prayer requests that Pastor John gave to us in our family time this morning, I want to lift up all those families to you, Lord. I, I lift up uh, Kathy, uh, Mary Pease's family. I pray for Brynyard. I pray for Paul and Bernice Brower, uh, Muriel Martinez, uh, Bonnie Parler, and Wendy Weaver's family, uh, cousins, families, uncles, sisters, brothers. Lord, I also just want to lift up our church family. And I also want to lift up Pastor John as uh, you speak to him this morning, Lord, as he prepares the message. And let your words um, prosper in our hearts to continue to build our relationship stronger with you. We thank you for the Sabbath, and we thank you for all that you do in our lives. We give it to all of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I go, I want to give you all... Um, this Thanksgiving uh, verse to all of you. And it's more of, a, it's more of a praise that David says in Psalms 118. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love forever. May you all have a happy Thanksgiving to you and your families, and also have a happy Sabbath.
it last forever. May we come out of this place changed and wholly yours because you truly are our only hope. And you stand on the end of time and invite us in. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it's kind of nice to be reminded of what our church looks like and what it used to sound like when we were together, wasn't it? Thank you, and thank you, Craig, for your prayer, and thank you, Jerry, for that children's story. Every now and then, there's a phrase that I hear, and I've heard it actually a number of times. Someone will say, you know, I have this friend, and he's not a Christian, but he's nice. Or maybe even, well, you know, I have this neighbor. She's not an Adventist, but she's nice. It always kind of puzzles and troubles me a bit when I hear that. What are we saying? It reminds me of a story at the beginning of Christian ethicist James Gustafson's book, Can Ethics Be Christian? He tells how years ago he and a colleague were doing some work for a corporation at some meetings in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan. They worked until after midnight, and when they were through working, they decided to just relax and chat a little bit. The only place open in the hotel at that time of night was the bar downstairs, so they went down to the bar. And there was a soldier there who was drinking and had obviously been drinking too much. In fact, the bartender probably shouldn't have given him any more drink, but the soldier ordered another. And when he paid for it, he gave the bartender a 20. The bartender gave him change for a five. Gustafson's friend that he had been working with noticed that and called the bartender out, said, he gave you a 20, give him his other $15. Well, the bartender denied what he had done, but finally gave him the $15 and said, well, I'll just do this to keep peace. But the soldier kept drinking and he was finally so drunk that he could hardly speak or even sit up. James Gustafson's friend said, we need to help him out. He's in trouble. And so he opened up the young soldier's wallet, tried to talk to him, but the soldier could hardly talk. Asked for his wallet. The soldier let him see his wallet. He saw where he lived. He lived on Long Island. And so Gustafson's friend took out a little bit of money, enough for cab fare and a good tip, and called a cab. And then the two of them kind of had to carry the soldier out uh, with his arms around their shoulders to the cab. And he gave the cab driver the money and said, now this is enough for the ride and the tip. I know that. And I've left a note with him telling who we are and giving our phone numbers so that he can ask us for more detail of what has happened. And I'm taking down your name and your cab license number and your uh, car license on the cab and am keeping that so that I will be able to check. And if there's any problem, I'll know who did it. I will check with his home and make sure that he got home safely. And I also want you to know, I know exactly how much money is in his wallet. And I expect that much to be there after you drop him off. And so they put the young soldier in the cab, and he was taken home safely. After telling the story, Gustafson tells us that this man that he was with, who took this extraordinary action on behalf of the soldier, was not a Christian. In fact, he says he's not even religious. In fact, he says he's actually kind of anti-religious, a very secular individual. Gustafson goes on to ask the question in the book, if there's something distinctive about Christian ethics and what it is that guides 
moral behavior. I would like to go in a little different direction and ask this question. How do you explain people like this being so nice and so kind when we seem to base our desire to be gracious on our love for God and our response to the way he has been so gracious to us? What about those who don't believe? They don't believe as we do. Maybe they don't believe anything. What about when they show unusual kindness and generosity? Well, I think the question is very easy to answer when we go to the Bible. And I want to answer it in two ways this morning. First of all, from a theological perspective of texts that we find in the Bible, actually focusing primarily on one text. And then secondly, some examples of how we find this to be true when we look especially at the book of Acts in the New Testament. So, first of all, the theoretical, the theological. In John chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, God, was with God, and the Word was God. And then we come down to, chap to verse 9 of chapter 1, and it says that Jesus was the light that enlightens every human being. Now, that verse is translated in two different ways as you look at modern translations. And the grammar could be either way. Both are correct. We just don't know which one really was intended in the mind of John when he wrote. One way to translate it would be that Jesus is the true light who enlightens every person that comes into the world. The other is to say that Jesus, the true light who enlightens every person, was coming into the world. But either way, the meaning is the same. Every human being is enlightened by the light of the world, Jesus Christ. John 4.42, after the encounter with a Samaritan woman, calls Jesus the Savior of the world. You see, God is the creator. In fact, there in John 1, it says that all things were created through the Word. And God created all of us in His image. Now, sin has marred God's creation. It has marred the natural world. But my, isn't there still so much beauty in it? It has also marred the human race with sin. But certainly it hasn't erased the image of God. Every human being is born in the image of God. Humans are still created in the image of God. And Jesus still shines his light on every human being. And so it should hardly surprise us to see God-like actions coming from those who were created in God's image and upon whom and in whom the light of the world is shining, whether they know it or not. So we should expect that we see God's image in humanity. What arrogance it is to think that we are the only ones who bear God's image. That we are the only ones who do God's will or work in the world. That somehow it's only people like us who believe our way who show God's image. All people are created in God's image. Now, we believe that we do have something to share with all people. We have good news because many people don't realize what a wonderful God we serve, and we have good news to share that. But it would certainly be arrogant to think that we are the only ones who bear God's image. Well, that's the theological part. Let's look at a more practical part, and I'd like to take us through some stories in the book of Acts. Stories of people who were not Christians, and as far as we know, 
never became Christians, but certainly seem to do God's will and God's work. I'd like for you to follow along. Get your Bible, follow along with me in these passages. We're going to look at four of them. The first one comes in Acts chapter 5. The disciples had been jailed for preaching Christ. They had been told no longer to preach Christ. God miraculously released them from jail, and the first thing they did was go to the temple and begin preaching again. And so they were called in and they were told, listen, we thought we told you to be quiet. We thought we told you to stop preaching. And you remember their response. We must obey God rather than men. Well, that made the members of the council called the Sanhedrin furious. These people in open defiance. And they decided there was only one thing to do, and that was kill these people. Get rid of them. And at that point, after they say, let's kill them, we pick up the story in Acts chapter 5, beginning with verse 34. Read along with me. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin, and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. That's the disciples. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census, and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. And then in verse 40, Acts tells us, his speech persuaded them. They let the disciples go. Now this man is a Pharisee. We usually think of them as the bad guys. But no, he shows great wisdom. He says, listen, don't, don't kill these people. If what they're doing is from God, you don't want to stop it. And if it's not, it'll die out. So don't get all excited about this. Let God take care of it. My, that is good advice, isn't it? It's not from a Christian or anyone that became a Christian. But good advice. In fact, there are a number of kinds of incidents in our world today where I wish more people could have this kind of attitude and just calm down a little bit. Well, let's look at another example. Acts chapter 19 this time. Paul is preaching in Ephesus. It's where he stayed the longest of any point in all of his travels on his, what we call missionary journeys. Three years he spent in Ephesus. But a man named Demetrius got really unhappy with Paul because Paul was hurting his business. You see, Demetrius was a silversmith. His number one product that he sold was a little idol, an image of Artemis, the goddess, whose temple was there in Ephesus. And so when people would come to worship at the temple of Artemis, or when they would uh, think about something that would maybe protect them, and that they could worship, they would buy these little silver images of Artemis. But Paul taught people that they shouldn't worship idols, and it was hurting Demetrius' business. And so he got people together, and they started a protest against Paul. And the protest turned into a riot. 
And the people gathered in the theater, that theater, the ru ruins of it are still there in Ephesus. And the people got all riled up and they started shouting. Now, Paul was not there, but you know Paul. He wanted to go and appear there. I mean, he's got a whole theater full of people. All the people in town are gathered. What a great opportunity to preach. But cooler heads prevailed and they kept him undercover. But the riot went on for two hours. And then finally, a kind of low-level city official, the town's clerk, got up and spoke. We read about it in Acts chapter 19, beginning with verse 35. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are judges. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what's happening today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly and they left. Here's a man who quiets a riot with nothing but good sense. What a difference he makes. He's not a Christian. We don't know that he ever became a Christian. But he certainly helped the cause of Paul that day and showed through his good sense that what people were doing was not what they ought to be doing. God used this city clerk. Acts chapter 27. Paul was on his way to Rome. Remember, he went to Rome as a prisoner. He had been arrested in Jerusalem. He spent the next two years in Caesarea, appearing before Felix and Festus and Agrippa, and then he appealed to Rome. And so he went to Rome as a prisoner. And now he was on the last leg of that trip, headed to Rome, on a ship with other prisoners. And they faced a terrible storm. Now, for soldiers, the worst thing you can do is let your prisoners escape. And if you let your prisoners escape, you're not going to escape. So it would be natural that soldiers would want to get rid of the prisoners and not let them escape. Better to kill them than have them escape, because that would put you in jeopardy. But Paul and his other prisoners were not killed. Notice what we read in Acts 27, beginning with verse 42. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Here is a Roman centurion. This is a military officer. He's in charge of these soldiers. He knows what would happen if the prisoners got away and escaped. But in the goodness of his heart, he wants to save Paul. And so he says, don't kill the prisoners. And they all jump off the ship and swim if they can and ride in on pieces of the ship. And every single one of them is spared. And they make it safely to this island, which was the island of Malta. 
Well, the last incident is in the next chapter, the last chapter of Acts, Acts 28. When they get safely on land, what happens then? Well, notice the first two verses of Acts 28. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Here are people, not Christians, they're on an island in Malta. And these people come, prisoners, floating in, who knows what kind of riffraff there is among these prisoners. But instead, they show them kindness, unusual kindness, Luke says, and take care of them. Then you remember there was that interesting incident where as they're around this fire, a snake comes out and bites Paul. And all the people say, wow, he must have been the worst of all the prisoners. Uh, the gods aren't going to let him go, even though he escaped the ship. But then when nothing happens to Paul, they decide that he must be a god and they're ready to worship him. And then we read on in verse 7 of Acts 28. There was an entire, there was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. Here is another official who shows generous hospitality. He's hospitable and welcoming. The people on this island are not Christians, but my, are they nice. You see, maybe our real mistake, when we say that someone is not us, but they're nice, is the whole idea of not us. Maybe our real mistake is thinking that people are not us, when in God's eyes, they really are. I think God has a lot of us's that we may want to think of as them, and that's our problem. Because all humans are created in God's image, and Jesus is the light that shines on everyone who comes into the world. And maybe the whole idea of us and them somehow becomes a whole lot less important when we realize that. One night I was in Washington, D.C. It was one of the first times I had been there. I was at a convention. My wife had a good friend that she had grown up with in Denver who lived in Washington, D.C. She hadn't seen her in a long time. And since I was going to be there, Ione asked that while I was there, I take something to her and uh, take Ione's greetings to her. So Ione told her that I would drop by. And um, one evening, after the meetings were over at supper time, I went to see this friend of Ion's. Now, this was back before the days of cell phones. We didn't carry around a GPS with us uh, wherever we went. But I thought I knew how to find her friend's house or apartment. She lived right in the city of Washington, D.C. It was some distance from where I was, but she lived right near a subway station and uh, metro station and my hotel was right at a metro station so all i had to do was get on the metro go to the right stop get off and i bought a little map uh, again no gps's had a map folded it to the right section had it in my pocket to lead me right to her place and i figured out what exit i should take from the what direction i should go from the metro station when i got there well, somehow I took a wrong turn. I went out of the wrong exit from the metro station 
and was going in an opposite direction than I thought I was. It was after dark and I couldn't see a sun or anything to know uh, what direction was what. And so I wandered about a bit trying to find her address. And I wandered into an area that did not look too good. It did not look very safe. And I was beginning to get just a little bit nervous. And then this kid came up to me, a kid, I say, he was a teenager or early 20s, maybe. And you only had to look at him to know that he was probably not somebody you were going to end up sitting next to in the pew in church. And he came up to me and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to find an address. And he said, well, it's not safe for you to be here. You shouldn't be here. This is not a part of town you should be in at night. He said, what are you looking for? Where, where's the address? So I took out my map and showed him where I was looking. He said, you took a wrong turn. You were supposed to go the opposite way from the metro station. And he said, you need to get out of here. This is not safe. And he showed me where I needed to go. And then he said, I'm going to walk with you for a ways to get you to a place where you're safe. And I was very grateful. And you know what? God uses people who don't look at all like some of us to be gracious and kind and do good things. You see, maybe we need to rethink the whole idea of them and us and recognize that all people are created in God's image, that God is the savior of the world, that he sent Jesus to show that he so loves the world, that he is the Lord of all nations. Sophia is going to lead us in a hymn called Lord of All Nations, number 588 in your hymnal. It was written back in 1960 by Olive Spanis, who was a mother of four and the wife of a Lutheran minister in Seattle, Washington. The first stanza says, Lord of all nations, grant me grace to love all people, every race, and in each person may I see my kindred love redeemed by thee.
And now may the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit, and the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, go with you all now and evermore. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the Sabbath, and God bless.